my name is Brian Kono. I'm an integrative pediatrician here in Denver, and um, I'm not used to talking to adults too much. So uh, <laughs> we'll we'll see how this goes. I'm I'm really honored to be here. Uh, my wife Tara is good friends with Sarah Seelig, and uh, I just feel was very honored to be asked um, to come here. Uh, I gave a similar talk to a palliative care group um, for kids, and I told them that I was on so honored to be there that when they asked me to do it, I said, I, I, I want to do it just, just sort of to be in the presence of people who do palliative care with kids, and that I was going to get more out of it than um, they were going to get out of it. And I feel the same way being here um, with, with you all. It's just, just sort of being in, in your presence is, a, um, is, is food for my soul. So if you, if you don't get anything out of this, then I will have um, gained something. So there will be a net positive. Um, if, you have never, if you've never walked into a talk where there were raisins on the table, then you're in the right place. Um, if, you, if you have gone to a talk where there were raisins, then you, I think you're also in the right place because we're going to, um, th there's, there's never too many times to have done this little mindfulness practice. And, and you only do have to save one raisin for now, so if you, if you want to eat them, you can. And I did use a spoon to take them out of the, out of the jar. Um, so if you, if you have never heard a singing bowl, I brought ours just because they're so lovely. And um, one way of being mindful is just to, to hear a sound and pay attention to it. Uh, so we're, I'm just going to do a couple uh, tones on there. We're going to come back to that in a, in a moment. So I know, uh, all of these talks, of course, they, um, whenever you go to an academic talk, they talk about disclosures. I don't have any financial disclosures. I, I am going to talk about, a, I think, a really great biofeedback tool that I gave you a handout on called HeartMath. Um, and I don't have any financial ties to them. But um, I, I promote them a lot with kids and, and adults that I talk to. Uh, I would say that, as a disclosure, I'm a novice. I am practicing this thinking about mindfulness and heartfulness, I'll talk about that distinction, but uh, I'm, I have a lot to learn. So uh, for any of you who practice some form of mindfulness, you may, you may or may not know that you do, um, but I'm, I'm always interested in hearing people's experience and um, tips that they have um, for the group too. We can, we can have some discussion, hopefully. Um, I, I don't know what it's like to be you uh, or have walked your journey here, that's another disclosure I would have because sometimes uh, in talks like this we will we'll give suggestions um, and we'll say things that uh, may resonate with you and then we'll say things that may um, sound absurd to you in wherever you're at in your life and in your journey. Uh, so I would invite you to take those things that don't really sound useful to you and um, just put them aside. In, in hypnosis we say if you're uh, let's imagine you're at a dinner party and you uh, take a, a piece of food that, that really doesn't taste very good. Um, you can imagine that thing that I say that didn't sound good to you, like that piece of food that didn't taste very good, and just kind of find like a, a potted plant somewhere <laughs> and stick it in the potted plant in your imagination and just leave it there. Someone else will, will take care of it. Um, the other thing I would say is that uh, even though it's the beginning of the conference and you, you, may be, you, you may be exhausted from something else, this is the one talk that if you fall asleep in it, I will, I will be honored because it will, be, it will tell me that you are, are relaxed and um, it's okay to sleep here, it's okay to leave. I'm okay with, with either of those things. So these are the, the few things I thought would be useful as objectives. One is just to consider the power of our mind and our body and maybe think about a little bit of a, a shift in the paradigm that where we separate the mind and the body. Um, so we'll talk about that. Uh, I also want to, in considering the power of the mind and the body, consider that it may, it may have no power for you, and it may have life-changing power, 
and everything in between is okay. Um, as a side note, my, one of my sisters has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, and lost a baby at when the baby was first born and has been through tons of hardship. And she, uh, I've mentioned to her carefully sometimes that this, some mindfulness practice or some biofeedback or some self-hypnosis might, might benefit her. I even gave her a name of somebody in San Francisco that I know. Um, and then I just left it there. And she has not taken to it in any way. And I'm perfectly okay with that because it's, I can't imagine what it's like to be in her shoes. And um, what I have realized is that she is mindful in a way that is not named. She is an attorney and a mom and she walks every day and does her job and takes care of her kids and is in the moment all the time without going to see somebody and without uh, having to practice mindfulness or meditate for an hour every day. I would like to um, see if we can invite you to experience a little bit of mindfulness and um, I don't think it has to be a discreet moment but the raisins are gonna uh, help us a little bit with that. And then remind ourselves of what we are capable of. We'll do a little talking about that. I would like to introduce to you the heart math tool and demonstrate it. And uh, if somebody is willing to uh, be a guinea pig, then we can do that. Or I can, I can show you how I do it. It's not that exciting. Um, and then I would, most importantly, just to walk away with a few tools that you could use. Simple things um, that'll range from something you can just do as you walk out of the room to something you could do as a more uh, regimented approach to your well-being going forward. So that's what we're going to go through. So the, well, the reason I was saying maybe a distinction between um, or a paradigm shift with the mind-body discussion, you hear that a lot. The mind affects the body. We know that there's a placebo effect um, that that is really profound. You might have 30 or 40 percent in in some medication trials, depending on the outcome measure. Um, and the placebo effect has its limitations, of course. But there's no, there's no disputing that um, you can take something that may not have a physiologic effect on your body, but that may alter your symptoms and alter how you, how you feel, how you perceive things. Uh, sports performance, I mean, that we, if you think of any, any really good professional athlete, they all use some form of mind-body exercise. They visualize um, and they, you know, they, they imagine the free throw going through the hoop rather than the, the ball hitting the rim and bouncing off. Because we know that if you imagined that a ball was going to hit the rim or you're going to miss completely, that you're much more likely to miss. And that if you um, imagine it going in a thousand times, before you take the shot that it's much more likely to go in. There's a whole you know, field that, are, that arise in the, arose in the 90s, psychoneuroimmunology, which is just to say that the way you think about things affects your nervous system, your nervous system affects your immune system, and it's not a, it's not a big leap to think that um, how we think about things and our mindset affects our immune system and affects whether um, you know, we're more likely to get the next cold that comes along or not. I want to do a little drawing for you that I do with my patients to kind of think about this fight or flight effect. So we, most people have thought about right and left brain difference. And one way that I learned to think about it, I heard a, someone who does biofeedback give a talk 10 years ago and she did a drawing like this, and it made a lot of sense to me. So if you have the right and the left side of your brain, people you know, think about, obviously, the right side of your brain controls your left motor. The left side of your brain controls your right motor. But you also hear the term, you're more right-brained, you're more left-brained. So your right brain, people would say, is your, is your art brain. And your left brain is more your math brain. And your right brain is more your instinct. And your left brain is uh, just more your logical brain. And one of those instincts, of course, is fight or flight. And in fight or flight, 
it, it's helpful. It's a helpful reflex. You um, see a, a dangerous situation. You come through a, some, some vines and there's a, a hungry tiger there. Well, then you're, the right brain, this is the way I think about it, the right brain sends lots of signals. It, it tells your heart to do something. It tells your, your lungs to do something. It tells your, your temperature to change. It gives a message to your muscles. It changes your mood, <laughs> obviously. Um, so if there was a tiger there in front of you, then your heart would beat faster, and your, your breathing would go up, and your temperature might go up or down. Your mood would be uh, scared or worried. Your muscles would get lots of energy. And your... Um, Things that are not as important for your safety would, um, wouldn't, wouldn't get as much energy, so your, uh, your stomach or your intestines wouldn't, would not necessarily get a lot of energy or nutrients or blood flow. So most people realize that this effect is real. The, the, the reason I pointed out to kids when I'm talking to them is that if you, what you see can make you go into this fight or flight reflex, this stress response, um, then what you imagine can make you go into that stress response as well. And this is the way that I think about it for them. Think about it like our instinctive brain is like a little two-year-old sitting in a movie theater. And the movie is coming from the left side of our brain. And the movie is either what you see, what you actually see. So if you're driving in your car, and uh, there's, there's an accident right in front of you and you slam on the brakes, then the two-year-old instinctively goes into the fight or flight reflex and all of these things happen without your body even thinking about it. If, if the movie that you put on uh, in your brain is just what you imagine, then when you're driving along the road and uh, somebody cuts you off, not in a dangerous way, but gets in front of you, um, and you start putting on a movie about how angry you are and what you're going to do to them when they pull over um, in their car or come to a stop, then the two-year-old thinks that that is real also. And your heart beats faster and your blood pressure goes up and your breathing is, is more um, erratic and faster. And so we all know that that happens. You, if you watch a scary movie um, and you're really into it, your heart rate's going to go up, your blood pressure is going to go up. Your, your body feels as if it's there. So we, we all experience that and know that, but what we don't take as much advantage of is the fact that the opposite is true. So if you practiced putting a movie on about something that was comfortable and relaxing, a place that you loved, people that you loved around you, and you practice doing that, the two-year-old believes everything that's on the movie because it doesn't know the difference between a movie and what's what you see in front of you. And the two-year-old makes your heart beat slower and makes your breathing calm down and your mood can shift and your blood pressure can drop. I was at, a, at the GI doctor a couple weeks ago and uh, I, my blood pressure was a little high when I walked in and he said, well, we're going to retake it in a few minutes. I closed my eyes started thinking about my funny two-year-old dancing and shaking his booty, and my blood pressure dropped like 15 points. So it's, re it's a real effect, and I think it's not a big stretch for most people to recognize that, um, but we just don't then take advantage of it and put it, put it into use. Um, and this is, this is really how self-hypnosis works, which I'm not going to talk as much about today, but self-hypnosis is basically a way of getting your brain to focus. And we all do this throughout the day. Kids are much better at it than adults, but there's hope for you. You can learn. Um, we get into a daydream and a trance. And when you're in a daydream and a trance, this two-year-old is like focused and glued on the movie. And when you're in a trance, if you give your brain a suggestion, like um, a switch in your brain or a button, and, and you do that, and then you think about how the button lowers your blood pressure. It sounds silly, but that's really how your physiology works. So if you wanted to um, fall asleep faster at night and sleep longer, 
and you imagined that there was a, um, most people know melatonin helps you fall asleep. If you imagined that there was uh, a faucet and out of the faucet came melatonin and everywhere that the melatonin touched in your brain, it got slower and sleepier, then your brain would really start to slow down and melatonin would be released from your brain and you would fall asleep faster. And, and it's really that simple. It just takes practice. That's what I tell our kids is it, it's simple. You can do it. If you practice it, it will change how your brain interacts with your body. If we have time, we may, we'll come back to that a little more. So what is mindfulness? And you brought up that question at the beginning. I need to learn what mindfulness is. I'm still working on that. Um, there's, there are different definitions. I like this one. Uh, Zung Vo is a pediatrician in Canada uh, who's worked with Thich Nhat Hanh. And he says that mindfulness is paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the moment. That's, that's uh, John Kabat-Zinn's definition. And then he adds with, with unconditional love, um, which I like too. But if, you don't, you know, if you're not that touchy-feely, you can skip that part. Um, so paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the moment. Um, and it's really just that simple. Ellen Langer is a psychologist at Harvard, um, and she, she's, she's given some great interviews and there are articles about her. Um, she steps away from just meditation and um, like the Buddhist idea of mindfulness, and she just says that her, her idea of mindfulness is just actively noticing new things. And this, if you take only one thing away today, this is the thing I would think about. She suggests just thinking about noticing five new things uh, but from a friend or um, your spouse or your child or uh, whoever you interact with on a regular basis. Just the next time you see them, notice five new things about them. And she says, and this, this I found to be true, they will come alive to you in an entirely new way um, just by noticing something. And it might be five new things or it might be it might be five things that you knew to, you noticed before, but you, you forgot to notice for months and months, something that, that you love about that person. And then you can take that a step further, which is you can just try to remember to actively notice new things. When I take a shower, I, I, I watch the, the drops on the glass and just sort of pay attention to them, trickle down for a few moments. When I, uh, when I take steps, when I remember, I um, think about how my feet are on the ground and how they're connected to the rest of my body and how amazing it is that um, I'm walking. And that is a, is a profound shift in a day-to-day -day life. Um, and if you only remember to do that once a day, it will have been a moment where you were, one more moment where you were mindful, um, more mindful than before. I was, my two-year-old and I were, running the other day and uh, he fell asleep and I was running around City Park and I uh, was so focused on running that I was just kind of looking down at the ground and then at the end I noticed that the, um, the trees were just starting to bud and they were swaying back and forth in the wind and I love watching the trees and for a second I was upset with myself because I hadn't been paying attention the entire way around and then I, and then I reminded myself it was really great that I noticed how beautiful those trees were for at least one moment when I was finishing up my run. Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a Vietnamese Buddhist monk who um, has amazing writings, and his art, one of his books is listed on your resource list, he suggests that we might think about calling it heartfulness instead of mindfulness. Because when we think about the mind, a lot of people conjure up um, some ideas that are not as helpful. You know, our mind gets in our way. Our mind um, keeps us awake at night. Our mind, um, sometimes it, it's a negative term. So the, I like to think about it like this too, heartfulness, sort of bringing your heart into that and, and paying attention to things um, from a heart perspective.
Um, this is one of those things where I think it's easy for me to say and may sound ridiculous to some people given the situation. But one example that um, is in one of Thich Nhat Hanh's books is he says he was talking to a, a dad who um, was having some, was feeling stressed. And the dad said, well, I've, I don't know what else to do because I've carved up my time perfectly. I have my time at work. I have my time at home with my kids. I have my time that I spend um, exercising and everything, I've, everything has its time. And I'm still feeling really stressed out. And then the dad said, after a while, I changed my mind about it and I started thinking, um, my time at work is my time. And my time with my child is my time. And my time with my wife is my time. And it's all my time. And now I have limitless time for myself. And, and, then he's, and then he points out, well, that might sound great and that might work for you, um, but you might really have tons of stress in your life or you might be dealing with um, an illness or you might, be, you might be in crisis and then that sounds sort of ridiculous and it's okay if it sounds ridiculous, but there might be a time when it doesn't sound so ridiculous um, and you can start to create that feeling of um, more sort of whole feeling towards your to your life and how things are um, how your life your different phases of your life feel I'm not going to talk uh, this is not a research talk and I don't give a lot of quotations but this is interesting mindfulness is is we were just talking about this how um, mindfulness is in the news and there are mindful school movements and there are um, it's you know there are mindfulness apps and uh, in 2000, there were 25 articles if you did a PubMed search on mindfulness. And in 2013, five years ago, there were 549, and there's probably, you know, two or three times that now. So there's a lot of interest in, in mindfulness and how it affects us um, and how it can help us. And MBSR is mindfulness-based stress reduction, and there are lots of therapists who practice this. Um, and there's, there are ongoing studies about how mindfulness-based stress reduction can, um, is, is beneficial. Um, this is one particular one where they actually show uh, brain mapping and show that gray, gray matter increases versus placebo type treatments for memory processing and emotional regulation um, and perspective taking. So there's, there's lots of research behind it. I don't really focus that much on it because I think what we're doing instead of uncovering something new is we're just kind of reminding ourselves of what we used to do, what people used to do before our lives were um, so taken out of the moment by our jobs, by our, um, by our cellular devices and our computers. Okay. I see that uh, everyone has saved at least one raisin, so that's... <laughs> That is perfect. Yeah, you're, do, you're doing fine. So, um, so we're going to do a, a little exercise. And if you're interested in doing it, you can. If not, you can just um, sit and, and pay attention to what everyone else is doing. Um, so you only need one raisin. So I might separate one raisin and just kind of put it on the napkin there in front of you. And. What we're first going to do, has anyone done this meditation before? Nope? Okay, good. If you have, it's okay. To, it's great to do it more than once. So we're going to take that one raisin and separate it from the rest. And first, I'm going to invite you just to look at the raisin and just notice something new about that that you may not have noticed before. Maybe it's the shape. You can pick up the raisin and feel it in your fingers. You might notice how the light reflects off it and makes different shapes. And just tr try to draw your attention to the raisin, how it feels in your fingers if you're holding it. And notice what it looks like, how it feels. And then you can bring the raisin up kind of close to your nose Take a draw a breath in through your nose and just smell what the raisin smells like and take a moment to do that.
and just kind of notice it there, notice the texture of it. And then whenever you want to, you can let it go into your mouth um, and maybe chew on it a little bit. And, and if you can, just wait on swallowing it. And just take note of the taste of it. Maybe notice if it tasted any different than what you would have expected. And then if you haven't already, you can swallow the raisin, maybe notice what that swallowing sensation feels like, how the muscles move in the back of your throat. You might trace the raisin as it goes all the way down, kind of think about where it is in your body, down your esophagus and into your stomach. You might call to mind, too, uh, the, the rain that it took to grow the raisin. Maybe think about rain falling on, a, on some soil and that nourishing, the soil nourishing the vine and the grape growing and the nutrients that end up in the grape. and then how the grape becomes a raisin, and then how the raisin entered your body and is giving you nourishment. Great, and when you are done noticing that raisin, you can end that exercise. I, I love this exercise, and this m might be because I'm so, uh, you could tell I'm interested in this mindfulness stuff, but um, I like it because we as Americans don't eat this way, and most people don't, um, and we tend to inhale our food and don't notice it. Um, so this is a way of thinking about that and no just noticing some different things, um, and that's really what a feeling of mindfulness would be, is just noticing new things in the moment um, and being in that moment tasting that food. I was alluding to this a little earlier. I think that all the buzz about mindfulness is really um, j just us reminding to get back to where we, where we were when we were children. Um, Kids, I think, are really good at being mindful, especially the very young children, especially if they haven't been, been given iPads and iPhones too much right away. Um, but you, if you notice, if you get to be around infants at all, um, they, they just sit there and study faces. And then at a certain age, they, they play with objects that you, you couldn't imagine um, keeping someone's attention for very long, but they'll just sit there and watch them for long periods of time. This morning, my two-year-old was uh, he, he grabbed a pair of scissors, which I know as a pediatrician, I wasn't supposed to let him do that. And then he, um, he was snipping at a crack on our countertop, pretending it was a ribbon. And he kept snipping at it. Dad, I'm snipping a ribbon. I'm snipping a ribbon. And then he, uh, he, he had the scissors like open like this. And he said, Dad, a yoga pose. <laughs> and I would have never thought of that. And he, it's just because he was... He, he wasn't thinking about um, what we were going to do next and what with the rest of the day, but he was just paying attention and using his imagination. Uh, he, it takes him 40 minutes sometimes to walk down the block, and, and most of us feel that sense of frustration when we're, if you interact with a child who does this, where you, you, we're, gonna, you know, we're walking to the park. Let's get to the park. Why are we, why are we rushing to the park? And he's noticing the cigarette butt that somebody dropped on Colfax, where we live close to, or the, um, the flower that just popped up. That, and he loves to point out the crocuses that you know, jump up right at the beginning of spring. And so he, he, being with him and with our other children is, is such a practice in mindfulness, because you just have to, they just drag you into the moment. You're either there in the moment with them, playing or you're stressed out about 
what you think you should be doing or what you could be doing with your time. Uh, so if, if you have that mindset where you can um, allow a child or a mundane task to bring you into the moment, it is an entirely different experience of that moment than the um, wishing you were getting on to the next thing and getting something done that you, that's on your to-do list. So I, I do think that some adults, like I mentioned earlier, practice mindfulness. They just don't know it. If, you, if you're exercising vigorously, I think some people really love that because, because they can't help but be in the moment when they're really exercising vigorously. Or we go for a, a hike in the, in the woods and we don't think that we're being mindful, but that's why we do it, because it, makes, it brings us into the moment. It takes us away from expectations of future moments. So it doesn't have to be, uh, you don't have to be a Buddhist monk, uh, and you don't have to practice that way. There's other, there are other ways to get at it. I, I think, I mean, has anyone tried this to like limit your cell phone use? Or, or have, a, have a, um, a, a time where you turn it off at night and you just, if it gets past that time, you just don't look at it. I mean, I think we, we have all started to feel that. You, you get so used to looking at the, the next news feed and the next news feed and you, and you might think that you're staying informed and you're, you're staying current um, and really you're just being drawn away from the moment every single time you look at the next text, the next news feed, the next email. And those things are important, but um, of course we feel better when we, when, we're a little, when we have some limits on that. I was sitting in the doctor's lounge at Rose Hospital this week and a, a, a surgeon came in and said, um, I've never felt so good. I, I, dis I cut myself off from the news for, for one week. And he was like, you know, he was like walking on air. Um, I do think it, it makes a big difference. And those surgeons, they're usually crusty and surly and, you know. I mean. <laughs> Any surgeons in the room? <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, we're, we're, I'm, I'm getting close to being done. We're almost at the time, I think. We started a little bit late. If I think there's a little bit of a gap in between now and the next session, so um, you're welcome to stay. I'm going to demonstrate this heart math tool because that's something that's on your list that you could, um, you could use on your own. Has anyone done biofeedback before? Um, let's grab this. I forgot to hook it up. Uh, is anyone interested in trying? If you're not, um, if you're interested in trying this, but you don't wouldn't want to do it in front of the group, I'm going to stick around for a little bit afterwards. And I have two um, heart math sensors, and they both can be used. Anybody interested? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's bring. I'm just going to have you sit in this chair. Tell me your name. Sam. Sam. So biofeedback, the basic idea of it is to take something physiologic that you don't normally think you have control over, like your heart rate, and um, show that you can do something or think about something and get a response from, from the screen about what you're doing. Scoot forward. Oh, it goes on your earlobe. Okay, so so first it's just going to show that it's, it's picking up your pulse. And the top graph is called heart rate variability. And so when we take deep breaths, our heart, our heart rate actually increases and decreases with each breath. If you're feeling really stressed or worried, then not only does your heart beat, oops, sorry. That's too loud. Yeah, that's a good sound. It's a good sound. The louder, the better. Um, I'm alive. Yeah, I'm alive. I don't know how to turn that down. You're good. We'll be okay. It's kind of relaxing. Yeah, okay, are you sure? Yeah. So if you're... It kind of sounds like your ball. If, yeah, it was, I think that's intentional. 
if your heart, if you're really stressed out, your heart rate not only beats fast, but it beats at a constant rate. So it, it doesn't vary. And so the, the idea behind heart math is that you can breathe in a certain way and that will change your heart rate variability. And when your heart is beating in a more varied way, then the rest of your body feels more comfortable. You're doing great. So um, this, let's do this one. Okay, so you can see on the right hand side, there's a little breath pacer and it's a suggestion. So when, it, when it's going down, you can breathe out. And when it's going up, you can breathe in. And you, and you take steady breath so that it's even as you go all the way to the end. And when it gets to the end, then you start your breath in and then breath out. And then breath in and then breath out. Now a suggestion is to take a breath into your heart space. So you would imagine the air going into your heart, filling your heart. Perfect. Great. Breathe in and then breathe out. You're doing great. With the next breath in, you might call to mind a, a happy memory and keep thinking about that, a person or an event, something that made you smile or laugh. Great. When you're in more coherence, the, it turns blue, and when you're really doing a great job of coherence, then it turns green. So you are natural at this, and great. Some adults cannot get it into green ever, uh, or at least with the first couple sessions. And even bringing a smile like that on your face um, changes your coherence level. And I usually, like I said, think about my two-year-old shaking his booty, and that c gets me right into the green zone. So this is a powerful tool. It only takes five or 10 minutes a day the idea behind it is that when you do this, you both consciously and subconsciously train your body to breathe in a certain way and then to couple that with your heart rate. And when your heart rate is coupled that way, your body relaxes. And so practicing it five or 10 minutes a day then allows you, when you're in a stressful situation or you are, um, something happens that that's, uh, was unforeseen, then your body, instead of going into the fight or flight mode, knows how to get into this automatically because you've been practicing and it's now a neural pathway that your body knows and just a deep breath can get you back into it. Calling to mind that, that funny or happy memory can get you right back into that space too. Are you sure, you, are you sure you've never done this before? I'm glad you did it and not me, or I'm not going to do it after you because you're doing so well. Do you ever use this to diagnose like, high anxiety or blood um, I always, when I put it on kids and teenagers, I put it on, um, with that, and I, I don't give them any expectations at first. And some kids um, seem so wound up and so stressed and they put it on, this is my 13 year old I'm thinking of, and they, they put it on and they, two breaths and they get it into green. So they, will sh they can shock you with how well they regulate. Some kids and adults, you put it on and you think they're sort of calm on their exterior and they cannot get it into red and it just takes more practice. Um, so I don't, I don't use it as a diagnostic tool mainly because um, if it's not going well, I tell them that's normal. You know, most people can't get it into green right away. Um, but I do, I do use it a little bit uh, without giving that label to people and then um, sometimes I would come back to it in a, a, a later time. My, my younger daughter, um, when she first tried it, she could, no matter what she did, she could not get it into blue or green. So we just left it for a couple years. And then she, wanted, she decided she wanted to come back to it, and she, now she can do it. 
So it's it's not the right tool for everyone, but it is a um, it is a really powerful tool. You did amazingly well. Thank you. That Great. brush was hard to find, but once you found it, it felt so natural. I yeah. was fighting that breath because I uh -huh. couldn't get to but it. It was quick. Yeah. So There's for me it was like, a minute or two. I, I, was like, breathe I don't that long. like I know. that breath. It didn't there, fit. Yeah, well, that's a good observation. I think you can... I was actually trying to slow it down for you, but there's some glitch in how it got hooked up. Okay. So you can change the pace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You change yeah. the pace for yourself. Yeah. So it's not trying to get you into it. You can take this off. Yeah. So, so what was funny for me, for, for you guys, was um, I'm, I'm a thinker. I have a really hard time sort of not letting my mind wander. So I'm trying to focus on this, and you're talking, and I'm like, no, Stop talking. Away. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I'm trying to do this, you know. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so that was kind of funny. That's good, yeah. I, that was the old, um, put the terrible tasting food in the, yes. in the potted plant. <laughs> it is now, I think just after 11, 11.08. So if anybody needs to so step out. Thing, yes, so that handout has um, the quick coherence technique, which is basically taking those deep breaths. There's a free app. Uh, called Inner Balance, which is listed on there. And if you want to get the sensor, you just go to their website. It has like a 10% discount code on there. Um, so the, the sensor is in a little bit of an investment, but then you have it. The app is free. The app looks like um, kind of like the breath pacer, and then it just changes colors for you. And you, tr you can track your, yourself um, and session to session and kind of notice what, what works best for you. Yeah. Um, if I sit with her while she does it, I find just what you said, you start going, you start doing it with them. Yeah. You don't have the sensor on. Mm -hmm. And even though you're not tracking yourself, you abs, I mean, you can feel it. yeah, because I'm terrible at it. I'm in my head. I am terrible at it. Gwendolyn is great at it. Um, but it's very helpful. And so even if you don't have the sensor, you can yeah. sort of enjoy the benefits. You know, well, yeah. It. And That's what right. Was saying, um, I'm a therapist, an occupational therapist. And, um, I used to tell my therapist, um, I was a supervisor, and I used to tell my therapist, when you go into the room, when you go into a patient's house, because we used to work in the community, I would say, I need you to check yourself at the door. And they'd be like, what do you mean? And I'd say, no, you need to check yourself at the door, you need to slow down your breathing. If you had an argument with your spouse, or you were just you know, in a terrible traffic accident, whatever the matter, whatever it happened, slow down your breathing and walk into that house with really slow breathing. Because what would happen is, and I saw it time and again, you would walk in with your garbage going on and like a crazy, like your breath is really fast and erratic and you'd walk in and you would change that patient's whole perspective and that patient's whole experience of your therapy. And, and so you'd go in there with these goals, these lofty goals of this patient's gonna do this, this and this. And you'd come out there going, oh my gosh, I didn't get, get any of my goals done. And it wasn't because what you, what you physically did, it was what you intentionally, you, you unintentionally did. You came in and you took your body space and you gave it to that patient, you gave it to that space. I tell my husband this all the time because he's in sales and I go, don't suck the life out of the room. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and he's like, what do you mean? I go, just don't suck the life out of the room. Don't go in there after you just had a meeting with all your sales guys and you're just really upset. So just take a moment and take a breath and relax a little bit. Then go in and go into that space and breathe, breathe air into the space, breathe newness into the space. And for him, because his business, he kind of thinks I'm a little crazy sometimes, but it really does work. Mm -hmm. um, you can, I do it with my kids, like you do it with your kids. I, if my kids are sitting there and, and my teenager is 16, she's like, oh my gosh, mom, this happened at school today. And I can see her, she's, 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 yeah, but she's quickly getting there in like two seconds. My husband can't deal that. He has to leave the room because he's like, she's overreacting. And I'm like, yes, but you're overreacting to her. <laughs> so then I just sit there and I go, okay, so tell me about it. And I just really start deep breathing, and I watch her go, oh, and she slumps back in her chair, and then she can start speaking to me. But if I go, oh my gosh, Shay, really? What happened? Are you okay? Like, can I check something? Mm -hmm. Then she's gonna go, woof, right up there. So yeah, you know? I think that's a, that is a beautiful piece of wisdom that you have have gathered. This is actually reminds me. Of, so this, it's a couple things to take home. Um, this doorknob mindfulness is is really good for us. Um, medical providers. So that the idea is that every time you touch a doorknob before you enter the room, you take a breath. And 
leave behind the things that you're worried about and just be with that person. And you, you don't have to be a medical provider or a therapist to do that. You can walk around um, and have some cue to your life. It could be doorknobs, it could be, if you work at a computer all the time, I would suggest you set some kind of, um, some kind of alarm or some timer that goes off and, and it reminds you to s just step out of that for a moment and focus. Um, some simple practice like that, the actively noticing new things, I think is the, is the, the best take home that doesn't require um, buying anything. So the heart math is an, is an option. The, um, there are lots of mindfulness apps. If that's something you feel like, I need a reminder, I want it to be regimented, I, I like you know, having the, the app tell me something to do. There's one called Moment Health, which is on your set of resources, which I think is pretty good. Um, some of the hospitals use it for healthcare providers. Um, you could consider a daily breath practice. And if you come to Tara, my wife's yoga, session tomorrow. She teaches a really great um, yoga breathing exercise. Um, but you don't have to have that. You could, um, you could count your steps and your breaths as you walk. I, that's, something, that's a nice way to, to think about breathing and be in the moment is just to count how many breaths it takes to take each step and slow, slow that down a little bit. Um, and these other suggestions are just to be gentle with yourself because nobody can um, step into mindfulness and just be mindful all the time. And um, if it fits for you to, to cultivate some gratitude, sometimes that you might be in a place in your life where it doesn't make any sense, but um, if you get to that place, then I think that, that helps us out a lot. I'm going to stick around for a few more minutes, and if anybody else would like to try, I have two ways to do the heart math. Um, but I really appreciate being here and uh, your attention and um, Thank you for letting me bask in your aura for a little while. Thank you.